Welcome back to Sex and Space. We are very excited to have you with us today for an episode which is dedicated entirely to all things sex and space. We were lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Alex Leyendecker from ASRI, the Advanced Space Life Research Institute, which is a Florida-based nonprofit dedicated to the comprehensive study of human sexuality factors and reproductive factors as they apply to space. Alex is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and spent seven years as a space operations officer for a spacecraft launch and recovery before he transferred to the U.S. Air Force Reserve as a helicopter pilot for a combat search and rescue. He completed a Master of Public Health in 2013 and a PhD in Human Sexuality in 2016, and his research focused on human sexuality and reproduction in off-Earth environments, the history of research in these areas, and the research gaps that have to be filled in order to make long-term settlement of other worlds a viable possibility. So he is thoroughly qualified to be here today, and we are very thrilled to have him talk all things sex and space. So let's get into it. Welcome back to the Sex and Space podcast. Um, I'm Toshi, and today I'm joined by Dr. Alex Leyendecker. Alex, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you. It's great to be with you. So we're here to talk about a subject which I think is probably long overdue on our podcast. We're here to talk about all things sex and space. Um, so Alex, you are the founder and director of ASRI, the Advanced Space Life Research Institute. So for anyone who maybe hasn't heard of that, could you talk us through what that's all about, please? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, ASRI was uh, originally founded um, for the specific study and research of anything pertaining to human sexuality and reproduction, factor, uh, reproduction uh, factors as they apply to uh, outer space environments. Um, as we uh, start to uh, gain what we're calling mass access to space uh, here with the advent of companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin, that are able to bring uh, quote unquote sort of regular uh, socioeconomic classes into outer space, uh, we're going to start to see a lot more normal people go up there. Uh, so there are a lot of questions that still surround human sexuality, reproduction, having babies, uh, and being able to safely and successfully settle places like Mars in the future. Uh, questions that uh, we're going to have to be able to answer to, again, successfully do those things. And can you talk to us a bit about your background and how you came to be involved in this particular area of research? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, my pathway to uh, getting into studying sex and space was uh, kind of a strange one. Uh, so I originally uh, have a operational military background. Uh, I started off, uh, you know, was a graduate of the Air Force Academy, the U.S. Air Force Academy, uh, back with the class of 2008. Uh, originally went into uh, space operations uh, where I did space launch and originally uh, had already decided that I wanted to go uh, study human sexuality uh, for postgraduate research. Uh, ended up doing a master's of public health in human sexuality, uh, ended up doing a doctor of human sexuality and a PhD and was originally going to study uh, sort of more counterintelligence focused uh, aspects of uh, human sexuality with regard to uh, adversaries that we were uh, sort of fighting uh, at the time, uh, you know, with the, uh, the U.S. government's uh, global war on terror. Uh, sort of had to pivot from that uh, because I got selected for to attend uh, undergraduate pilot training in, in, I think it was late 2014, early 2015. And I was faced with the prospect of not completing my Ph.D. dissertation at all because I was well behind mm -hmm. on my research, wasn't able to... Uh, effectively gather data the way that uh, that I was hoping I was going to be able to. Uh, so sort of did a 180 degree turn uh, at the uh, behest of my advisory board uh, and switch over to a topic that I'd always maintained an interest in because of my uh, operational space background. Uh, so mm -hmm. combined, you know, my postgraduate uh, pursuits with my operational pursuits, uh, so chose to study sex and space. Uh, what surprised me at the time was how little research has actually been done in this area, uh, not just with regard to human sexuality, but even with uh, regard to reproduction, which, you know, just reproductive biology is, you know, you think of it as a very scientific, basic thing that we're going to need to be able to settle new worlds. Uh, but NASA um, and other national space agencies around the world, uh, while 
having done some small experiments, uh, seem to be sort of behind uh, the rate of research at, at which we really needed to be uh, if we are going to do things like settle Mars by the 2030s. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now we have effectively established that with the small experiments that have happened uh, through those agencies that there are clearly a lot of problems and a lot of hang-ups that happen with, uh, with reproduction. Uh, not even going near the general human sexuality question. Mm -hmm. uh, but reproduction alone, we know that there's, there's a lot of sort of critical shortfalls that, uh, that we still need to meet and things that we're going to have to mitigate in order to successfully reproduce uh, in outer space environments. Uh, so my uh, research process effectively revealed that to me, uh, which came as something of a surprise. Uh, but the product that came out of that, uh, out of my dissertation, was the recommendation for what would eventually become ASRI, uh, a private nonprofit 501c3 organization that uh, studies sex and space and effectively tries to take that off the plate of NASA and government players who, for social political reasons, aren't really able to approach it as much. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we try to have the conversations that other people are not going to be able to. And how have you found people's attitudes towards the research that is being done in the space? How have they changed over time? Have you noticed a shift at all? Uh, in the uh, decade plus that I have been in this field, I would say I have noticed a shift. Uh, that has been in part due to the rise of what we call new space versus old space. Uh, new, spa new space has been around for a very long time. Um, but has only recently really started to gain a foothold in the market. Uh, so commercial space endeavors are now really the leaders of uh, space launch. So you think of companies like SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, while uh, not quite at the level of SpaceX yet, is you know rapidly closing ground, uh, where you have these privatized commercial companies that have broken technology barriers that even governments had not uh, had not met yet. So, for example, uh, being able to have reusable rocket technology and landing a rocket back on a pad, uh, which, if you've never seen with your own eyes, is is pretty amazing to witness. Uh, I happen to live in Cape Canaveral, so I get to see it all the time. Awesome. Um, these companies have sort of forwarded the conversation uh, or pushed forward the conversation on uh, outer space exploration and development. Uh, NASA and government space agencies, which are sort of more of what we refer to as old space, you know, the old space crowd, uh, because in previous years, governments were really the only ones that were wealthy enough and able enough to uh, be able to uh, launch mass into space. Uh, mm -hmm. But with the uh, rise of these commercial companies, we're now seeing whole new areas of industry open up, and a lot of I guess you could say dreams that uh, the that capture the imagination of the not just American public but the global public back during the space race of the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Uh, so are really going to be able to come to fruition fairly soon. Uh, and we've been talking about this for decades. You know, it's always been right around the corner for decades. But now we actually have the prospect of gaining mass access to space, where the cost of uh, launching mass into space falls below a certain number uh, where you can send quote-unquote regular people like I mentioned earlier into into space for a attainable price you know not necessarily mm -hmm. a a cheap price but an attainable price uh, given their socioeconomic okay. means where middle-class level individuals in uh, industrialized economies can afford a ticket to uh, fly on a commercial space flight that means that uh, within the next five to ten years, uh, possibly as soon as 2026, which is a lot sooner than five years, uh, we could break mm -hmm. that barrier and you could see regular individuals. I don't think it will happen very quickly, but it will it will happen relatively quickly. Uh, you'll see individuals uh, able to pay something like you know ten to twenty thousand dollars for a ticket in it, a ticket into space. Uh, these individuals are going to not really be of the cut of your traditional space travelers, which are professional astronauts that have gone through years and years of training and decades of preparation and have, you know, been the top of their class in everything they've done. They've gone to test pilot school. They've gone to medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, astronauts come from, professional astronauts come from a lot of different backgrounds, but 
we're starting to see the rise of private astronauts, uh, still very highly trained individuals and very accomplished individuals. Uh, actually, my uh, uh, my research partner of uh, one of my research partners of the last ten years and uh, ASRI's chief of space medicine, uh, Dr. Shauna Pandia, uh, just got selected to be an astronaut a few days ago. Uh, so we're all oh, really excited about that uh, over cool. at ASRI. Um, and she will be a uh, private uh, astronaut for Virgin Galactic. Uh, she is one of the smartest and most accomplished people I know. Uh, probably has ten times longer a resume than, than I could ever put together. Uh, and we're, we're all very proud of her. Uh, so she is part of this first cadre of, of private astronauts that you're starting to see go up. Uh, but once costs fall below a certain level, uh, I'm thinking roughly uh, below $100 a kilogram, you're going to be able to see, again, regular people go into space, and you will have an entire cislunar space tourism economy and a general cislunar economy that you see rise uh, with that. And as comes with regular people living you know, regular lives and doing things like going on vacation in space, uh, mm. then you can expect that they're going to engage in the normal type of activities that people engage in on vacation, which uh, people tend to have more sex when they're on vacation or when they're you know, on a holiday away from, mm. away from home. Uh, so sex <laughs> in space is, is going to be a serious factor. Do you anticipate the research that needs to be done to make that safe, I guess. Um, do you think there's enough time to do that before that happens? It's sort of a yes and no uh, answer to that question. Uh, myself and my colleagues and the scientific community that we are part of, we are working diligently and as rapidly as we can to uh, establish and accomplish the research that uh, needs to be done before that does happen. To be perfectly frank, uh, given the timeline of how, f how rapidly mass access to space is developing versus how quickly we are accomplishing research as a community, I don't think that we are going to have all the answers that we really need to address um, serious scenarios in the future. Uh, so I was um, privileged to be a, a co-author on a, a paper that was a green paper that was released uh, about a year ago, uh, and it will be released as a journal paper uh, here, uh, so probably sometime in the next uh, few months, uh, that discussed uncontrolled conception in space, the risks of uncontrolled conception in space, uh, because you have this massive wave of new space tourists that will be going up into space who are, uh, frankly, not well informed of the risks, uh, so mm -hmm. they cannot really you can't really establish informed consent which is what we're seeking to do uh, just okay. be able to inform space future space travelers well enough that they are not taking unnecessary uh, risks and that they're trying to mitigate as well as they can uh, as well as the companies that are flying them into space mitigate as well as they can uh, those risks so that you don't have the risks of things like ectopic pregnancy which could occur um, that is I mean there's a perfectly decent chance that an ectopic pregnancy, which is a very dangerous situation for both the mother and the baby, um, that is a re very real possibility that could occur in microgravity from the literature that we do have. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, going, going into the next uh, five to ten years, uh, we certainly won't be there, I think, in the next 18 months, but we are taking steps to try and uh, mobilize the research community to get this research done. Uh, so uh, actually I can, I can share this now. Uh, so right now we are planning uh, for 30 and 31 October of this year, 2024, uh, we are planning the uh, first international symposium for human sexual health and reproduction in space. Uh, this is gonna be cool. uh, location to be determined, but it will be in Houston, Texas. Uh, and we are uh, trying to bring together a coalition of the uh, brightest scientific minds in the world, uh, ethicists, uh, business people, to define a consensus mission roadmap for all the experiments and uh, research missions that will need to occur, including those that are actually launched into, into space and occur in microgravity, uh, to establish safe parameters for eventual human reproduction in space. So this will involve mammalian reproduction, uh, it will uh, you know, involve a host of analog uh, scenarios and uh, analog human astronaut uh, research missions uh, that we hope can 
really provide a, um, can illuminate the path forward for how we avoid tragedy and are able to establish informed consent for, uh, for future space travelers. So is the risk more about conception in space rather than the physical act of sex in space? Uh, near term, absolutely. The highest uh, risk right now is uncontrolled or unplanned uh, conception occurring in a space environment. Uh, because we know so little, uh, we know enough to know that there's a lot of dangers involved uh, and there's a lot of anomalies that can occur. Um, I already mentioned ectopic pregnancy, uh, but there, uh, just for general sexual health, there um, are a lot of, uh, we, we could call them undesired outcomes uh, that, uh, that can happen for the reproductive system in outer space environments uh, because of those uh, microgravity levels and because of heightened, level, heightened levels of radiation. Uh, if you spend too much time in a highly irradi irradiated environment, uh, there is the possibility that you could uh, become sterile, uh, so not be able to reproduce at all. Uh, and coming back to Earth, um, there there is some chance of recovery, but the longer that you are up in space, the, uh, the greater the chance that you're you could be uh, permanently sterilized if you were exposed to high levels of radiation, uh, just, to, just to give an example. So, yeah, so near term, uh, uncontrolled con conception is definitely the greatest concern. Uh, down the road, when we were talking about long-term space missions and flying to places like Mars and beyond, uh, there are a lot more dynamics that come into play, including uh, psychosocial dynamics, crews of spaceships, of future traveling spaceships, going hundreds of millions of miles are effectively going to make up micro-societies. Uh, so what happens mm -hmm. if somebody has psychological issues or there are things like romantic rivalries, sexual riv rivalries, jealousy, mm -hmm. uh, that come into and impact crew dynamics uh, can even lead to conflict and eventually mission failure. Uh, I think that has been covered pretty heavily in a lot of Hollywood films, but it's a very real concern uh, mm -hmm. from you know, from a psychosocial aspect uh, that we we need to look at and to research and honestly in place, uh, you know, put things in place that sort of help mitigate uh, those concerns, especially when it comes to things like crew design, crew planning, um, and how you design the actual mission. And in terms of the research that you've already done, what has something, has there been anything that's really like stayed with you or something that you were surprised to learn? I think the biggest surprises for me came early on with sort of how far behind the curve we are as a species right now with this, uh, because mm -hmm. um, the space community has always sort of come, um, they've come from a place of engineering solutions. Uh, so a lot of people that work in the space industry are engineers, they are, uh, you know, sort of the, the hard scientists or hard sciences uh, scientists, so you know, your physicists and like. Um, but the space life sciences, uh, which is human physiology, human, you know, human health, and just keeping people well uh, in those environments has always sort of fallen on the back burner. I mean, if you look at mm -hmm. the, uh, the mitigation practices we use for keeping astronauts healthy on the space station, even while they're losing muscle mass and losing bone mass, uh, NASA actually schedules astronauts on the ISS for, you know, two hours of physical activity a day, you know, exercise and using resistance bands and trying to, trying to keep your muscles. But really, as uh, one of my uh, PhD uh, advisors said, uh, who was a NASA physician for a while, uh, he said, that's a Band-Aid uh, in a conversation with me. That's really not addressing the root cause of the problem. You need to mitigate the the microgravity itself, you know, you need to try and generate some sort of artificial gravity, you need to provide adequate shielding against the radiation levels uh, because really we're we're just, pat, you know, we're patching patching holes as opposed mm -hmm. to addressing why the holes are being created to begin with. Okay. Uh, so, yes, us being, us being behind as much as we are, especially in the area of reproduction and how how taboo it is to discuss um, it 
kind of surprise me, especially since the end goal is multi-planetary, multi-generational settlement. Mm. You cannot settle planets other than Earth if you don't get answers to these questions um, and, and solve them, frankly, in the future. Mm. Um, if we go to Mars and we have not figured out how to safely and successfully have babies on Mars, then, and I've said this in other, you know, on, in other interviews, on other podcasts, uh, we will die off one generation deep. Uh, so you need to be able to um, continue those generations on, and that includes continuing the old-fashioned way. So, you know, we think mm -hmm. a lot of science fiction films where, you know, we're growing new humans in test tubes and we're, you know, doing, you know, clinical biotechnology, and some of that will come into play uh, in order to steel ourselves against new and radically altered environments. Um, but really thinking about it, humans are still going to have sex, humans are still going to reproduce the old-fashioned way, mm. um, you know, good old, <laughs> good old biology. Uh, it is <laughs> one of our innate drives, and you are not going to be able to stop or prevent humans from doing it. Uh, so mm. it is best that we start thinking about planning for and addressing these challenges now uh, mm. while we're still in a one Earth G environment, uh, you know, while we're still under the blanket of uh, radiation protection that is garnered for us by our atmosphere and our magnetosphere, uh, and start designing the habitats that we're going to need to traverse space uh, safely to, you know, not just uh, not just really protect the uh, the process of reproduction, but protect general human health, um, and and be able to arrive safely and then thrive in these environments when we get there. Mm. And we have to ask this question because we're a sex in space, but has anyone had sex in space? I know you've answered this question a lot, but I'm sure yeah, answers and I actually, want to know. So I, I do want to, um, I do want to acknowledge it is awesome that, uh, we are talking about this topic on a podcast named sex in space. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, I do have to ask, am, am I the first time you guys have actually discussed sex in space on the podcast? Yeah. Yes. And okay, so I think we're, I mean, yeah, 65 episodes in or something. Um, and we wow. came across okay. it and we were like, we have to, yeah, we have and to we, talk to you. <laughs> and we find, and we finally got to it. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I actually was asked this, uh, asked this question by, uh, some uh, some partner colleagues the other day uh, for another organization that uh, that we're looking to work with in the future and they and they you know said the age old question they said we have to ask you know knowing what you know uh, have humans ever had sex in space um, the answer to that is uh, currently still unknown I actually I actually sort of knowing what I do know and having done the research I've done I actually fall on the side of, I would say that it likely hasn't yet. If it has, I don't think it's occurred on the American astronaut side. Okay. Um, if anything has occurred, I would say, uh, and when I say has occurred, I'm talking about intercourse between human beings, you know, um, you know any kind of sexual contact occur occurring between two humans mm. uh, or more. Uh, I would say that there's possibility that it could have occurred uh, on Mir, uh, when Mir was still up in orbit. Um, I don't know I, that I would be comfortable assigning probabilities to that, uh, but on the American side, knowing the culture of NASA, knowing the culture of American astronauts, and also just how well we monitor our astronauts and all their you know all their uh, physiological <laughs> markers while they are on missions um i just don't think that there was as there would have been as much opportunity for uh, americans to engage in sexual activity again i'm talking person on person as opposed to mm -hmm. solo activity i think definitely masturbation has occurred in space um for example the iss uh, the russians have been known to bring pornography and alcohol on board um okay <laughs> so uh <laughs> so yeah I, I mean i think i think that that we can assume that uh that masturbation has occurred in the last 60 years of of humans flying in space especially for those mm -hmm. stints where uh humans have spent over six months you know a year uh up in up in space uh, it's just mm -hmm. not something that's really talked about um for uh, although <laughs> 
there have been American astronauts that have been asked in the past, you know, hey, how do you have sex in space? And I think yeah. one of the responses was, with your hand. Um, so, <laughs> okay. so I, I think I that we could, we, could, we could call that circumstantial confirmation that, uh, that you know, solo activity has occurred up there. Uh, mm -hmm. There has, uh, this is the one that's always talked about, there was an American uh, married astronaut couple that went into, uh, went into space in the, in the 90s. Uh, I think it was STS-47 was the mission. Uh, it was one of the shuttle missions. Uh, the astronauts in question were Mark Lee and Jayden Davis. Um, I know that they've had this question beaten to death over the last, <laughs> you know, three decades. And they yeah. are tired of, you know, it getting lobbed in their direction. Um, <clears throat> But effectively, the story, or essentially, the story there was, um, they met in astronaut training. They effect, they eloped, and got married, and didn't reveal this news to NASA until roughly two months before their mission was supposed to go up. It takes a long time to train astronauts for specific missions, uh, so NASA elected in that case not to replace either of them on the mission, uh, just because they didn't think they could get. Uh, my understanding is they didn't think that they'd be able to retrain somebody uh, quickly enough or train somebody up to the uh, for the specific mission uh, before launch was supposed to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. So they did launch together. Uh, I, I forget how long they were in space together. I think it was for at least a week. Um, and the story uh, that I've heard is that uh, NASA was very, very displeased uh, with having to deal with the media storm that that occurred, and as way of reprimand, they sort of uh, put them on on opposite uh, work schedules. Uh, so there, you know, there are photographs uh, from that mission where you know they're, you know, the couple is together, and they and you know, Mark Mark has his hand around uh, around Jan's waist. Um, they are actually no longer together. Uh, I, they later got divorced. They both remarried uh, other people. Uh, I. If I recall correctly, I actually reached out to them while I was doing my dissertation research uh, because I honestly just wanted to hear their perspective of having been the first family in space. You know, and family units will mm. be very, very important for settlement when we eventually get to Mars. Uh, but never, uh, never, you know, got any response. Although I'm, mm. I'm pretty sure they read my emails. Uh, <laughs> but again, this is a topic that they've avoided for years and years, decades at this mm. point, and and they're, you know. Tired of tired of uh, you know having opposed them. Uh, there has been uh, I mentioned the Russians earlier and kind of higher likelihood being there. Uh, the Russians are quite a bit more uh, open-minded about human sexuality in general. It's not as big of a deal to them, um, you know, the same way it's not as big a deal to to Europeans. Americans are very prudish when it comes to sexuality and just discussing sex in general, uh, so it's it's kind of a, a dirty topic in American culture, um, mm. even though we plaster it all over our advertising and everything else, so it's <laughs> kind of ironic. But uh, there have been periods of time of isolation where there was a very attractive uh, Russian female cosmonaut and a very attractive Russian male cosmonaut that were up on mirror for, I want to say it was a period of uh, roughly six months of overlap, oh. uh, where they were both there and it was just them. Uh, so there, I think in the Russian media, there was lots of, you know, tittering and speculation about mm -hmm. if something, if something could have occurred because they were both very good looking people. Uh, although for the record, they were both married to other people that were back on earth. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's, there's chances that, you know, romance could have hap happened. Uh, isolation does weird things to people. Uh, you know, we see this in, uh, you know, in the military and deployed forces around the globe. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen that in the in the American military before um, but everything that we have heard so far with regard to human sex happening in space is uh, is hearsay and I've I've always tried mm -hmm. to sort of shy away from it uh, because I think it distracts from the more serious questions of uh, you know what is going on with reproduction and how do we solve mm -hmm. those challenges you know and how do we how do we successfully reproduce as a species in the future? How do we solve the the social issues that are gonna and the psychological issues uh, that are gonna rise uh, that are connected to sexuality on long duration missions that that you know could threaten the safety of the crew um, you know because if somebody has a mental breakdown in space mm. and uh, snaps effectively 
uh, they are now a threat to the rest of the crew. And mm -hmm. people can snap uh, over romantic rivalries very easy. Uh, we've actually seen that, you know, and even NASA astronauts are not, um, they are not immune to that. We actually saw that, I want to say it was back in 2007, there was a sort of infamous incident in which a, there were a pair of NASA astronauts that had a romance, um, broke up, and then one of the, one of the astronauts, uh, very, there was a very public inc incident in which that astronaut threatened the, uh, the life of the other astronaut's new lover, uh, and that incident, uh, which made headlines all over the U.S. and I think the world, wow. uh, resulted in both of those astronauts being ejected from the NASA astronaut corps, and uh, NASA instituted a, uh, or they created a code of conduct. They had to establish a, a specific written code of conduct uh, to make sure that this kind of thing didn't didn't happen again in the future, uh, wow. because that was you know a very public, you know, it was a very embarrassing thing that, uh, mm. that NASA as an agency had to deal with, uh, you know, mm. kind of a, a PR event. So, uh, humans, question still in the air. Uh, I think that will be definitively answered uh, here in uh, probably within the next decade. Uh, we will have absolute confirmation that somebody's had sex in space. Um, and we can talk about mechanics and stuff uh, a little bit later if you want. Uh, Animals have had sex in space. Rats have had have had sex in space. Uh, so if mammals, <laughs> mammals have had uh, fish, yeah. uh, and uh, you know other 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 uh, animal species, including insects and and amphibians, uh, that is all confirmed. We have conducted reproduction experiments that included mating. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first one occurred. I want to say in 1979. There was a, a Russian uh, Biosat, uh, Cosmos 1129 was the mission number, uh, which involved uh, two male rats and five female rats, I want to say, and uh, those mat those rats did mate. Uh, although uh, we're not entirely sure if uh, fertilization occurred because no off okay. offspring came out of that experiment. And so, when you're you know you're doing this research and so it's you know very much looking into like reproduction and conception. Do people, are there any misconceptions that people have about the work that you do? Uh, being that I'm a, I'm a sex researcher um, and my uh, PhD uh, was in human sexuality, uh, people uh, have, you know, have asked me in the past if, I mean, people that are not informed on it at all, you know, they, they've asked me if I'm an astronaut and stuff. And I said, no, I, that would be awesome, but, <laughs> but I am, I am not. Um, tend to, uh, you know, tend to ask if what we're doing is, is trying to, to get people to, to have sex in space, if those are the kind of experiments that we're setting up, and the answer to that is no, but we are interested in the outcomes of when that does eventually occur. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is pretty straightforward. There was, a, uh, there was a period of time when we were initially launched as a research institution. The name of the institute was actually Astrosexological Research Institute, uh, which, you know, astrosexology is the study of uh, sexology and sexology applied to space, uh, so the study of sexual sciences uh, in off-Earth environments. Uh, but uh, the, the name never, I, I have to give it credit, it never failed to turn heads, uh, but the uh, the focus is not just sex and the act of sex. Uh, mm -hmm. It is everything that goes with it. Uh, mm -hmm. So we want to think about uh, how family dynamics are affected. We want to think about how uh, a tribe forms in these you know in these new environments. How sex impacts that from an anthropo anthropological uh, perspective. Um, obviously, we want to know about reproductive biology because we need to be able to reproduce uh, on Mars and on other celestial bodies throughout the solar system eventually. Uh, so, yeah, overall, um, I think the the original name clued people in a lot faster to uh, to what we were about. Um, but now, you know, we're, we're able to sort of explain at our pace uh, mm. what exactly it is that we, re we research and, and what ASRI is all about. And for you personally, is there anything in particular that you're most curious to learn about through this research? Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, a lot, actually. Um, 
one of the things I'm most curious about is how we are going to evolve as human beings once we get to these new environments. Assuming we can mm -hmm. reproduce at all, uh, and we're a hardy species, and I think that we will be able to overcome the challenges that we need to, um, that our, our biology will eventually be able to overcome the challenges, but we have to acknowledge that for the last you know 3.7 billion years that life has existed on Earth, and we've evolved from single cell organisms all the way to very complex sentient organisms that we are now, that we're able to develop technology and have this conversation leave the cradle of our existence, the Earth, to go into space. Mm. Um, all of that evolution has occurred in a one Earth G environment in the cocoon uh, of life that we have here on our little you know, blue marble of a planet. Uh, so we have always been protected by the radiation of the of the outer universe, or protected from the radiation uh, that's coming from the rest of the universe, uh, because of the shield of our magnetosphere and our and our atmosphere, uh, and we've always had one Earth gravity. Uh, so we're going to suddenly and radically change that as we go into the new environments of space. Uh, very different levels of gravity, very different levels of radiation. You know, how is that going to impact our evolutionary biology? Um, if we are able to thrive on the surface of Mars, are those, how different are those humans going to be on a cellular level? You know, how, um, how much are we going to change? Uh, there's been speculation that you know, human beings who are born and live out their days on Mars will have you know, longer, uh, you know, longer leg bones, um, so they'll be taller. Um, you know, kind of taller, thinner versions of the humans that we have on Earth. Um, so we're going to need to uh, consider the the different uh, branches of the human species that might evolve uh, out of uh, out of Homo sapiens as we as we traverse these new worlds, uh, because you will have potentially uh, human beings that spend their entire life on Mars. Uh, you will have human beings that spend their entire lives on uh, on Earth ships, if you will, uh, traveling across the stars to go to new solar systems. Mm. Um, and you could potentially have giant rotating habitats that we place throughout the solar system and orbit around other celestial bodies, around other planets. Uh, so there's a very there's a very broad spectrum of environments and environmental conditions that uh, that future human uh, generations could be exposed to and have their mm -hmm. evolutionary bi biology impacted uh, by. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm very curious as to how that is going to develop um, and if we're going to be able to keep pace. Mm. And what kind of um, organizations are funding this kind of research at the moment? Uh, so right now, very few. <laughs> If there's uh, any VCs or um, you know folks that want to want to contribute to the uh, future development of humanity, uh, I would encourage you to go to our website. Uh, it's uh, asri.space, so a s r i dot space. Uh, or uh, if you are interested in uh, backing our uh, scientific symposium that's going to be happening in October, the address for that is space dash reproduction dot org. Uh, and you can go there and query about uh, potentially potentially being a sponsor. Uh, for the science that has happened and is happening right now, uh, the only uh, organizations that have really been funding it uh, are uh, governments. Uh, so most scientific research has to be funded through government grants uh, and, and uh, you know, private donors. Uh, normally, you know, through charity contributions and, and things like that. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to, to fund science. Uh, For-profit is a very different um, endeavor, obviously, but a lot of the research that we do, the reason that ASRI is a nonprofit is because we want to make sure that this research is uh, equita equita equitably accessible uh, for all of humankind. Uh, mm -hmm. Because in... Our minds, uh, going by our philosophy, uh, no government or organization should control uh, what I have often referred to as the keys to the universe. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, all humans should be able to eventually leave this planet if they so if they so choose and be able to reproduce and uh, create new settlements uh, in on other new worlds. Um, so, ASRI's intent is to open source uh, most of our findings. Uh, with uh, the only things that we would hold close to our chest is things that we're really still investigating. Um, uh, but uh, we do eventually hope to uh, to share our mission roadmap with all of humanity and you know act as a sort of uh, centralized coordination hub for the research community across the globe uh, because this truly will need to be a uh, a global effort to get all this research done. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, partner organizations that we have uh, pri that are private for profit companies. A really good example is uh, Spaceborn. Uh, United, which is based in the Netherlands. Uh, if you want to check them out, you can go to spacebornunited.com. They are a for-profit uh, company that is researching uh, clinical IBF in space. Uh, so, more biotechnology focused, uh, but uh, we have been we have been aligned with them for uh, for over half a decade uh, at this point, uh, and they are they are doing great work. So there are efforts. Uh, it is primarily decentralized. You know, it's it's sort of a disjointed effort that's happening across the planet right now. Uh, but that is the primary uh, reason that we are uh, trying to consolidate everybody together uh, for this mm -hmm. uh, this symposium that's going to be happening in, in October. Uh, so that as a community, we have a very defined path forward and we can start going at it as a group. Amazing. Um, and just before I wrap up, I wanted to ask, is there anything, any questions I haven't asked that you would like to share with our listeners relating to any of the research that you're doing or have done? There is going to be a lot of exciting stuff that happens uh, in the coming years, um, not just in this field, in this research, you know, this research area, um, but space as a whole. Uh, so commercial space has very quietly, um, well, maybe not very quietly, but um, perhaps the world has just been really distracted. There are so many technological advances that are coming in just the next few years uh, that the world 10 years from now will be unrecognizable. I mean, people will be mm -hmm. blown away by the changes that enabling a cislunar economy is going to make to the Earth. Uh, how rapidly it will help uh, technology develop um, how abundant access to resources will be, um, and really how, uh, you know, how amazing the universe itself is. You know, we all, we all like to look up at the stars, um, but I think with the way the world has been the last few years and the distractions that we've had, uh, we have sort of, uh, forgotten that, or a lot of people around the world have, have forgotten that, certainly in industrialized countries. Uh, but with advances that are being made in a lot of, a lot of fields, uh, including space, um, there's there's going to be a lot of exciting developments to come. Uh, so if you uh, you know if you want to follow us and follow what our, our research is doing, um, I think uh, you know we can we can share our, our social media accounts with you and yeah. and website and all that. Uh, but it's uh, ASRI dot space, uh, and we we try to to keep up with our press releases to let you guys know what's going on. And as one final question, in a um, hypothetical universe, if all of these research gaps were um, addressed and we could, you know, humanity could settle in different worlds that weren't Earth, would you go or would you stay on Earth? That's a great question, actually. Um, I, I would visit, uh, so I... I think I would be perfectly happy, especially if the duration of the journey was shortened significantly, because uh, you know I don't want to be exposed to uh, the the harmful environments of space for too long. Uh, but if I were able to go visit Mars uh, for a short period, that is absolutely something I would do. Um, I would absolutely go to the Moon. Um, I would absolutely visit other planets in the solar system, and you know hopefully with in these you know coming centuries we're going to be able to establish settlements and that's something people are going to be able to do is you know go visit uh, other planets and even do it as sort of a holiday mm. uh, sort <laughs> of thing. So cool. um, Earth will always be my favorite planet. Um, I love living on the Earth, I love this planet, um, I 
hope that we all learn to, to think of her that way and take better care of her. Uh, there is uh, something... There is something very special, I think, that mass access to space will um, trigger in a lot of people that are able to able to afford a ticket into space, able to travel there and look back at the Earth. Uh, and that's something that's called the Overview Effect. Uh, there is a book called The Overview Effect, uh, uh, written by, uh, I would call him a friend, a friend of mine, uh, Frank White, um, who I've you know come across at various conferences and... Um, had the pleasure of sharing a cab with once, uh, but the overview effect is a psycho psychological and emotional phenomenon that occurs when you look back at Earth from space for the first time. And uh, everybody that has traveled into space, or at least the vast majority of them, have described this effect. It is a very spiritual experience when astronauts mm -hmm. look back at Earth for the first time, and you see our planet very fragile, hanging against mm -hmm. the the blackness and the vastness of space, um, mm. and you realize just how very special it is. So, yeah. Earth will uh, Earth will always be my favorite. Um, you know, I was born here. I intend to I intend to uh, to die here. Um, so, I I hope that I get to visit these other places. Uh, but uh, yeah, Earth is it for me. Hundred percent. That seems like a really nice place for us to wrap up um, our podcast. So thank you, Alex, again for taking the time to be here and share your knowledge with us and also for staying up so late to do so. I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank it. you for getting up so early and uh, absolutely <laughs> my pleasure. We really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Before we sign off, we wanted to ask you for your help. Because we talk about sex, we keep getting shadow banned across a lot of social media platforms. And this not only makes it hard for us to be found, but it says that sex is not okay to talk about. Not only is sex okay to talk about, it's totally essential. Because more knowledge equals better outcomes across a whole bunch of measures for all of us. You can make a difference, and the thing that we need from you is your active support. So please follow the podcast and sign up to our socials, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, whichever you like. You can find us over on sexandspace.com and click on our social links from there. Help us make sex an okay space. Thank you for taking this Sex and Space trip with us. Until next time, safe travels and we'll see you on the next Intergalactic episode.